Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste Today we begin a new module which is logging and yield. This module will have three lectures. The first one is logging and processing, followed by growth stock and rotation, followed by yield and sustained yield. So, we begin with logging and processing. Now, we have seen in the previous modules that in the case of forest management, we need to regenerate the stand and when we say regeneration, we also fill some trees that are there on the stand to make way for the new growth of the young plants. Now, when you have decided following any silvicultural management prescription that certain number of trees are to be removed from the forest or from a stand, how do you remove them? What is the procedure? What are the things that you need to be careful about when you are removing these plants is what we are going to see in this lecture. Now, the process of logging begins with a stage that is known as cruising. Now, cruising is a stage in which the forester surveys the timber lands. So, this is essentially a process of surveying to locate and estimate the volumes and grades of standing timber meeting the requirements. Now, what does that mean? We have seen in uh, one of the earlier lectures that when you are uh, uh, when you uh, want to remove certain trees, the first thing uh, the first trees that we remove are the dead, dying and diseased trees. But then the question is where are those trees? Because if we consider a forest, so if this is a forest, then all the dead, dying, diseased trees will not be at the same location. Probably this tree is a disease tree, but then if we look at a complete stand, probably you will have a disease tree here, a few here, a few here, probably a few here, then a few dead trees in this location, a few here and there and a few dying trees that are spread here. Now, the question is this is a stand in which you are having these dead, dying and diseased trees. Now, your forester needs to know where exactly each of these trees are located. So, that he when, uh, when these trees have to be removed, the forester can go to that location or a contractor can go to that location and fill these trees. So, the first stage is surveying. So, you, you survey for the different kinds of trees. Next, you also do a surveying of which are the trees that are silviculturally available to be removed, which means that we should be having certain trees that are past the their filling age. So, they are large size trees, they have sufficient diameter, they have sufficient girth and so now these trees have to be filled. Now, when you want to do filling, then invariably you will want to remove these trees or these timber. Now, when you have to remove this timber, you need to make a plan. So, the plan would be for instance, where should you make the roads for your vehicles to get inside? How many vehicles do you need? How many workers do you need? And how are you going to arrange for these logistics? Because in the case of any forest, we, we prefer not to perform any of these felling operations in the rainy season because if there is a rainy season, then probably the roads will not be in a serviceable condition and the vehicles when they are uh, when, when you are trying to get the vehicles into the forest, they might get stuck because of which the whole uh, the whole operation would stall. Now, if you want to remove these timber before the onset of the monsoons, then you need to make a very detailed preparation about on what day which vehicle and how many laborers would be at which location. So, for that you need to have a map 
that is showing you the locations of different trees that have to be filled and also the volumes of those different trees that have to be, be filled. Because suppose there is a, suppose you have vehicles that can only, only carry say 20 cubic meters of timber. Now, if there is a location that is having say 25 cubic meters of timber, then probably you will have to plan your routes in such a manner that your trucks are able to move, uh, move out with a full load. So, you need to create this map. So, the first process in logging is cruising in which the forester surveys the timber lands to locate and estimate the volumes and grades of standing timber. Grades of standing timber meaning whether it is uh, whether, uh, whether this is a class 1 or a grade 1 timber, grade 2 timber, grade 3 timber and so on. Why? Because if you are having a location where you are having grade 1 timber and you are filling that timber, then probably it is much more economical to harvest that timber even at the cost of, uh, of certain other timbers probably having a larger volume, because this is a more expensive timber. So, uh, the forester is surveying to f estimate the volume and the grades of standing timber which meet your requirements. Now, once this cruising has been done, the forester will, will come out with a map. So, this is a map that has been created and this map is now telling you that apart from these trees that are dead dying and diseased trees, there are these trees that are large in size that have to be filled. So, suppose this is a map that the forester has come up with. Now, this map or this information needs to be translated back to the field, because your forester has done this or this paperwork, he has identified which trees have to be filled, but now he or she needs to go back to the forest and paint those trees in different colors, so that the contractor who will go later on to cut these trees knows that these are the trees that need to be filled. So, this is the next process which is known as marking. Marking is the careful selection of trees for harvesting based on a forest management prescription. So, this is a selection of trees. Now, how do we do this selection? So, in the first stage when the forester went into the forest, he or she made a list of what all species are there, in which locations, what is their height, what is their girth. And suppose you have decided that you are going to fill all timber. So, you fill timber that is greater than say 90 centimeter girth at breast height. Now, when you are making a list of different trees, so suppose you have tree number 1, which is having say 70 centimeter girth, tree number 2, which is having say 95 centimeter girth, tree number 3, which is having 98 centimeters, tree number 4, which is having 100 centimeters, tree number 5, which is having 60 centimeters tree number 6 which is having 97 centimeters and say tree number 7 which is having 101 centimeter. Now, suppose your forest felling prescription has come out in such a manner that you have to remove one third of the trees. So, out of every uh, three trees you are going to remove one tree. So, in this case because you have uh, these seven trees probably you will remove 7 by 3, which is approximately 2 trees. So, you are in this case you want to remove 2 trees. Now, when you are removing 2 trees, which are having the girth of more than 90 centimeters, then you could say go for the first 2 trees, these 2. So, this one is having 95 centimeter, this one is having 98 centimeter. But then when you are doing these operations, then probably it will make much more sense if for instance, in place of going with for with these two trees, you went with this tree and this tree, because these are meeting all your prescriptions, but at the same time these are the more larger size trees. So, in that case you will be able to extract much more volume of timber. So, if that needs to be done, then this is a process of the selection of the trees. So, even though you were having so many different trees, 
So, tree 2 could be selected, 3 could be selected, 4 could be selected, 6 could be selected and 7 could be selected. So, you had all these different trees, but out of these 5 trees you only selected these 2 trees which were number 4 and number 7. Now, when you do this and when you translate this information to the ground, then this is marking. So, this is careful selection of trees for harvesting based on a forest management prescription. So, in at all times you are ensuring that the forest man management prescriptions are being followed. So, you are only removing uh, one third of the trees, but while following the, the management prescriptions, you are also removing those trees that are much more profitable. Now, when this information has to be put back to the ground, we typically make use of colored rings. So, these are the standard colors that are used. So, if there is a tree that has been colored uh, with a yellow or orange colored strip. So, what is this colored? What are we talking about? So, here you have a tree. So, when we say that this tree will be marked, it means that we will remove certain amount of bark from this area and we will paint a strip all around this tree. So, this is a red colored marking and this red colored marking would tell us that this is a boundary tree. If suppose in place of a red colored marking, we went with a yellow colored marking, it would give a signal to the contractor that this is a tree that has to be felled. So, these are the strips that we put around these trees by using paint and all of these different colors will give different meanings. So, a yellow or orange color marking will tell the contractor that this is a tree that has to be cut or for harvesting or for tending operation. If it is a blue colored strip, it means that this is a tree that is not to be cut. This is a tree that needs to be retained and typically these are trees that are on the banks of rivers. So, if this is a river and these are the trees on the bank of the river, what will happen if we uh, do a felling in this area? Well, if we do a felling then probably there will be much more amount of soil erosion, the banks will get eroded and the, the river will change its course. So, in that situation what we do is that we paint these trees with a blue colored paint and this will tell the contractor that this is a tree that is not to be filled. Now, typically there are also certain other trees. So, suppose there was there is a tree that was say planted by some emperor or say some viceroy and you need to main you need to preserve this tree for say cultural reasons or for historical reasons. In that case as well you will paint this tree with a blue colored ring. So, a blue color will tell the contractor that this is a tree that needs to be retained and not to be cut. A red tree is a boundary line tree. What that means is suppose this is your forest and this forest is divided into different compartments. So, the trees that are falling on these boundaries will be given a red colored band, so that people know that this is a boundary. A white colored line will tell that this is a tree that belongs to a research plot. So, this is not for silvicultural purposes, this is just for research purposes. So, nothing needs to be done in this area. A black colored marking is a correction marking, it is to mark over mistakes. So, suppose there was a tree that had to be reserved. So, you had to paint it with blue color, but for some reason in place of blue you painted it with an orange color. So, an orange color would tell that this tree should be cut, but then you realize your mistake. So, what will you do? You will go back to that area and paint it and over paint it with a black colored strip. So, a black color will tell you that will tell the contractor that there was a mistake that was done and the other color is the correct color. Now, this marking is done with the use of a marking register. 
Now, this is an example of a marking register. If you look at it in more detail, this says marking list of coop number XFS 3 ERWC 2015-16. The area is 260 hectares and here you see that you have a tree number. So, all the trees in your stand are numbered and for each tree you have the name of the species, you have the girth at breast height, you have the condition of the tree whether it is uprooted, hollow, burent, broken etcetera. Then you have the estimated bole length that you will uh, get when you cut this tree, estimated volume or length and any other remarks. So, for, inst for instance, this tree this paddock tree is having a buttress. Now, a buttress means that your tree is like this. So, this is your tree, but then it has roots that are coming out and they are supporting the weight of this tree, but then in this case it will be difficult to fill this tree at say the breast height. So, these are the remarks that we also put into the marking register. Now, once you have marked your trees, the next operation is felling. Now, felling is cutting trees using axe, saw, chainsaw or other device. So, felling is the actual process in which you are cutting or harvesting the trees. Now, whenever we are doing felling, the foremost thing, the most important thing is safety on the forest floor, because a tree is a very <coughs> tall organism. Now, sub and forestry happens to be one of the very uh, accident prone professions. So, if you have a tree and you are filling it, then if you are not careful, this tree may fall over the person. And if that happens, it may result in say an injury or even death. So, whenever you are, whenever any forestry operation is being done, the foremost thing to be kept in mind is safety on the forest floor. Now, what kinds of safety uh, operations we need to be aware of? One, if there is a stack of timber, people should not walk over this the stack, because timber is typically a cylindrical object and if you try to walk over it, there is a good chance that it will roll and you will topple down. I mean it is just common sense, but you need to be aware of it. If there is any machine that is working, then for each and every different machine, there is a minimum distance that you need to maintain, so that uh, there is no chance of injury. Then when a tree is being felled, then also you need to maintain certain distance from the tree. Then you need to, uh, to use certain protective equipment such as helmets or such as goggles. So, that when uh, somebody is say using a chainsaw, then there will be, uh, be some amount of, of powder, uh, 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 powder from the operation that comes out. Now, that powder might get into the eyes. So, if you are doing, uh, if you are using a chainsaw, it is better to make use of goggles. Similarly, uh, if there is a machine that is making a very large sound then probably it is good or, or it is much more prudent to go with an ear muff. And whenever you are doing anything, you should have a planning meeting in which case uh, you should talk with uh, your uh, with your colleagues about what is it that you are going to do, so that nobody is caught unaware. All of these are very common sense things, but they need to be ensured. And similarly, whenever any tree is being filled, then the escape paths need to be decided uh, from the beginning. So, suppose you have a tree. So, here you have a slopey ground and there is a tree that is standing here and you are trying to fill this tree. Now, if you are filling it in such a way that it falls in this direction, then, pro then you should not be standing in this place, because in this case the tree may fall over you. But then if you are trying to make your tree fall in this direction, there is also a chance that it will fall in the opposite direction. 
So, here again you should not be right behind the filling direction, because this is a more accident prone area. So, typically whenever we do a filling operation, if the filling direction is here, then this is a no go area and right behind also is a no go area. And these are two escape paths that we uh, decide, which are at 45 degrees to this line. Now, whenever the filling operation is done, typically it is done using uh, three different cuts. So, here you have a tree and you want this tree to fall in this direction. So, how can you ensure that? So, we do this by first making a cut here a cut here and then we remove this portion of the log. So, after this, this section would look like this. Now, in this case you have created a hole or a notch to the right of the tree. So, now if uh, and right after that you start giving it a filling cut or a back cut from this side. So, you will use your axe or a chainsaw to start cutting the, the tree from this side. Now, because in this area you have created this, this gap this hinge. So, your tree will start falling in this direction and when it starts falling the fibers in this side they get more and more stretched. When they get stretched and you use your chainsaw, so one, uh, one after the other the fibers are getting cut and then your tree is now uh, giving a more and more greater lean and slowly and steadily it will topple to the right side. So, typically what we do is that suppose this is the trunk. So, you will give it a face cut. So, this is the lean or the filling direction. So, in the lean or the filling direction you will give it a face cut. Typically this face cut is given to a depth of 1 by 3 of d, which means that this depth is one third of d. If this is d, then this is one third of d. So, this is the face cut. Then you give a back cut from the back side. So, this cut will move in this direction and there will be certain amount of wood that will be left out. So, what we are saying here is that when you are doing this operation, this cut does not completely go to this point, because before it reaches this point your tree will have already top, toppled down. And this section which is known as the holding wood, this would act as a hinge and this will hold the, the tree together till it falls to the ground. So, these are the, the cuts that we make the face cut and the base and the back cut and the face cut is comprised of the top cut, the bottom cut and then you have the back cut. So, when you begin your filling operation the first cut is this one. So, you make use of your chainsaw or your axe to give it a cut like this. So, this is the first cut, this is the, the second cut and then you start giving it a, it a cut from the back and then your tree will topple to this direction. Now, when you are making these cuts you create faces, which is why we call it the face cut and typically we use three different kinds of faces. The first one is a conventional face. Now, in the conventional face the first cut or the top cut is at 45 degrees to, uh, to this line or to the vertical. So, you have a 45 degrees cut which is the top cut then the bottom cut is parallel to the ground. In the case of a Humboldt cut you uh, or a Humboldt face your top cut is 
parallel to the ground, the bottom cut is at 45 degrees and in the case of an open cut, you bake an angle which is greater than 70 degrees. So, these are three typical faces that we make use of and all these three different faces have different utilities. The conventional face gives the greatest accuracy in constructing the face cuts, because in this case this angle is very easy to construct, because you are seeing it from the top. So, from the, the top this cut and this cut both of them are easy to make. In the case of a Humboldt face, there is a greatest saving of lumber, because in this case you have lost in the case of conventional cut you have lost this much timber. What we are saying here is that when you gave it a conventional cut, then when the tree falls down, then typically you will get a section that is looking like this. Now, but in this section, because this portion is hollowed out or is, uh, is having a smaller size. So, typically you will have to cut this log from this location and this portion is now no longer available. So, there is a loss of, of timber that happens in the case of a conventional cut, but in the case of a Humboldt cut, because the uh, your top cut is parallel to the ground. So, in this case there is a saving of timber. Now, in the case of an open face, there is the greatest amount of control that is provided by the hinge wood, because you can make these cuts very easily and at the same time you can have different angles for different uh, tree species, because of which you will have much more control over the way in which your tree is falling. So, in this picture we are seeing a front cut that is being made. So, the, uh, these people are trying to topple this tree or cut this tree, so that it falls in this direction, because of which they have given it a, fr a face cut in, uh, or a front cut like this. Then you have the, uh, the back cut that is being made here. So, in the case of this tree, the front cut is on this side and now these people are trying to make the back cut and when they are doing this back cut, they are making use of a saw and in this case two people sit at the base of this tree and then they, uh, they, uh, they saw this tree to give it a back cut. Now, whenever this these cuts are made, then the holding wood would form a hinge and this hinge would typically be seen also in the stump. So, in this case when this tree was felled, then the then this was the holding wood and the fibers have gotten stretched and this, uh, uh, this holding wood was serving as a hinge till the tree fell to the ground. And this is where we are seeing certain felled logs that are there right next to the door or to the road. Now, in more advanced countries, we typically make use of automated machines and this machine is a combined logger machine. So, what it does is that here you can see that it has an arm and this arm will typically grab a tree near its base then it will cut it at the base, then it will turn it and then there are rollers that are moving this, uh, this, uh, this log like this and then it is cutting it at specified distances. So, let us have a look at this video once again. So, here what we are saying is that this is the automated machine, it has cut a tree and then the log has now come down. and it is now uh, see this is the log and then this is the tree and it is now uh, rolling this tree and it is cutting it into different uh, smaller sides 
sections. Now, once your tree has come down on the ground, the next process is that of delimbing. So, delimbing is cutting off of the branches and these branches are typically left on the site. Now, why are they left on the site? For two or three reasons. One, it is not very economical or not very financially lucrative to cut the uh, to, to carry these small branches, which typically have lesser diameters uh, out of the forest, because there are transportation costs involved, there is uh, certain logistic cost involved and because they do not fetch a large value. So, it does not make much sense to carry them away from the forest. Second, when you leave these uh, uh, these branches out there on the forest, typically these branches also have a number of leaves and these branches and these leaves form a layer on the ground, which then protects the, uh, the young crop against grazing. So, this is another benefit. The third benefit is that these leaves will form a mulching layer on the forest floor and will typically moderate the conditions, which will help the, uh, the next generation. So, this is the process of delimbing, where you are cutting off the branches and typically leaving them on the site. The next process is that of bucking. Now, bucking is cutting off timber into logs. So, for instance, here you have a very large sized uh, tree and it is difficult to carry this tree uh, in toto and in this case uh, the uh, the foresters are cutting these tree this tree into smaller sections so like this section it is easier to carry it into the uh, uh, to the market now when the uh, when this filling is done in india we also make use of hammer marks now if we look at this face, here we are seeing that there is a triangular mark and it is having certain numbers. So, this is telling us whether this tree is legally cut or whether it was illegally cut. So, typically the foresters are issued different hammers for different purposes. These hammers are, uh, are, uh, are taken on record and whenever there is a felling operation all the trees that have been felled in that area will be marked with this hammer. So, that whenever you have any log that is seized from somewhere and if you have a hammer mark, you can always trace it back to when and where this particular log was felled. Next operation is that of skidding. Now, skidding is the process of movement of logs from the forest to a landing area. Now, landing area is an area where your vehicles can get inside and you can put the logs onto the vehicle for transportation. Now, why is a landing area important? Because if you go inside a forest, there will be so many different trees that it will be difficult to bring a large size truck or other vehicle into the forest area. So, typically the, the, the trees that are cut uh, in the forest are brought to a location that is closer to the road and this is known as the landing area and from the landing area it will be picked up by a truck. Now, the process of taking your timber from the forest to the landing area is known as skidding. Now, from the landing area you can make use of a truck very easily, because you have access to the road, but from the forest and typically if you have a forest in a hilly area and suppose this is your road and this is the landing site. So, how do you carry a lumber from this place to this place? That is the question. So, typically this is done using say elephants. So, here is this picture from uh, the Andamans and here we have this elephant, here you have a log that has been filled. So, uh, notches are made at the end, then uh, we tie an iron chain and this chain is then attached to the elephant and the elephant carries these logs to the landing site, from where we will make use of a truck. In certain areas, we do skidding using tractors. Now, here again the uh, uh, this lumber is not on the tractor, the lumber is tied with a rope and this rope is tied to the tractor. 
So, it is essentially skidding it over the ground. In certain areas, we also make use of manual labor and using all of these, we bring the, uh, the timber to the landing side. So, here you have um, the logs that are there on the landing side. In certain cases, we differentiate these logs based on the diameters and in which case, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we make uh, clumps. So, that uh, we have a vehicle full of load uh, for each of these stacks. So, we will have these sorts of stacking. So, everywhere like this image is from Finland, this image is from Harda and in both these cases, the process is one and the same. Now, here we are seeing a, a marking of this stack. Now, this stack in Madhya Pradesh is known as a thappi. So, this record is now telling you that this is a thappi number 56. The sa stands for sagon or teak. So, here you have sagon, latha, balli and dingri. So, latha is a log that has a very large size, a large diameter. Balli is a log with a smaller diameter and dingri is typically the smaller branches that you can either leave on the forest floor or in the case um, of, uh, of our Indian forest, uh, the villagers might also take them uh, for use in say uh, for use as say uh, firewood. So, this record is telling us that in this thappi number 56, we have 113 lattas which is large size logs. We did not get any balli in this, uh, in this stack and there are 201 dengri which is the smaller branches. Next, we do the loading and transportation. So, loading and transportation is movement of logs from the landing area to the depot and this loading can be done using a crane. So, in here we are seeing that this is a landing site and here we have the road, here you are using a crane to carry uh, to move these logs onto a truck. It, it can also be done using a forwarder. Now, a forwarder is a machine in which you have a truck combined with a crane. So, in this case, this is a landing site and this forwarder is taking these logs and putting them in on itself. Now, this is how a forwarder works. Now, in this case, this forwarder is taking the logs and depositing them on the uh, to the depot. So, here it is taking it out and it is dumping them on this stack. So, here you have a crane, here you have a stack of logs that are there in the truck and with this machine, you, we are taking these logs and then using the crane, we are, uh, we are taking them out and dumping them. So, this is how a forwarder works. Now, when we have taken these logs to the depot, typically we get a huge quantity of logs. So, this is a, a timber depot in Harda district of Madhya Pradesh and here you can see that you have so many logs that are there in this depot. Now, what do we do next? Now, the first process that is required is that of seasoning. Now, what is seasoning? Consider a green tree. So, when this tree is felled, it will be having huge quantities of water inside it. Even our bodies are roughly 70 percent water. Similarly, with plants, they are roughly 40 to 50 percent uh, of their weight is made out of water. Now, if you have a log that is having a very large quantity of water and then once uh, this tree has been felled and this uh, log is kept out if this log is exposed to say the sun, then what will happen is that there will be a very rapid loss of water from this log. And when that happens, then typically we will start seeing certain deformities in the timber. So, for instance, your timber may get cracks, it may get split or in place of a flat timber it may start showing 
bends or warps or kinks and so on. Now, to reduce this possibility, we make use of the process of seasoning. Now, seasoning is the process in which we reduce the, the amount of moisture that is there in the timber in a controlled manner. So, in uh, lower temperatures and uh, in, in such a phased control manner that there is not uh, that uh, that we do not have a rapid loss of moisture which would result in certain deformities in this timber. Now, here what we are saying is that these logs are kept in the shade of this tree, so that they are not exposed to the sunlight. And so, under th uh, this tree the logs will slowly get seasoned, they will slowly and slowly the moisture will get out and these will become seasoned logs. Now, another, pro, another thing that happens in the depots is grading. Now, in the case of grading, you classify these logs, so that the logs of similar diameter, similar girth and similar soundness are grouped together. When we say similar soundness, it means that those logs that are not having any holes, that are not having any splits, that are not having any warps they are the best quality of timber. So, all those logs will be grouped together. Now, within that group those logs that are having the largest diameter and the largest length will be grouped together and so on. So, typically a grading operation is also done in a depot, which will res result in the formation of these graded lots. So, here you have all these timber they are looking similar all of these are looking similar. So, uh, for instance these ones are having larger diameters these ones are having smaller diameters. So, this is the process of grading. Now, once the grading is done the next process is the graded logs. So, what this person is doing here is that he is taking the measurements of each and every log writing them uh, on the face of the log noting them down in the depot register and at the same time he is making lots. Now, typically we make lots in such a manner that uh, one uh, that one lot will fit in one truck. So, it is one truck full of load that we uh, make in the form of a lot and then these graded lots are then put up for auctioning. So, this is the whole process of logging till disposal of the wood. Now, once you have disposed of your wood what happens next? So, there is a merchant that uh, who has procured your wood, who has purchased your wood Now, what is he going to do with that? Merchant can make furniture out of the wood, he can make door or window frames, he can make doors or windows or he can use it to make certain other artificial products such as plywoods or, or particle boards. Now, what is plywood? Now, these days to reduce the consumption of wood, plywood is advertised as a good option. Now, the best thing about plywood is that it comes in a uh, in the form of a flat sheet. So, it is very easy to work with. So, how do we make plywood? A plywood is made by converting your log into very thin sheets. The process is very similar to sharpening of a pencil. So, you take a pencil and you put it through a sharpener and what we get here is these flat sheets of the wood. Now, plywood is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the process of making plywood begins with this stage. So, there is a sharpener, there is a wood or a log that is put with the sharpener and it is converted into very thin sheets. Now, typically how this works is that you have a log and this log is rotated on a machine and you have a blade which touches the surface of this log and this log comes out in the form of sheets. So, here we are seeing this process. 
so there is a machine and this person is collecting the sheets that are coming out of the machine this is how the sheets look like so in so uh, using a single log now we are able to get very large number of very thin sheets now these sheets are then uh, kept together in the inventory and to convert these sheets into plywood workers apply glue to this to these sheets so here you have a machine which has two rollers and there is glue that is uh, uh, which is uh, moving across these rollers so there will be a person on the back side who will be, be, be who will be putting these sheets one after the other through these rollers and on both the faces of these rollers the glue will get applied and this next worker is now collecting these sheets which have glue on both the sides now these sheets with the glue they are now arranged on a table in such a manner that we alternate the arrangement so typically if you have the sheets that are like this in the first layer then in the second layer the sheets will be kept like this so the direction of the fibers is interchanged with each layer so that it is having uh, so that it uh, so that the final product gets a more uniform property and is having a sufficient strength in all the directions so this is what this person is doing so you have one sheet that is below then uh, the next layer of sheet is being put on the top then all these sheets are put into a hydraulic press which then presses these sheets together typically the ends of these presses are also heated up so this uh, this press will now uh, apply great amount of pressure to these sheets and this will ultimately get converted into a plywood now when these sheets have been glued together the pressure has been applied all that remains is to cut these uh, these con these conjoined sheets into standardized shapes which are known as plywood so in this lecture we began by looking at the logging operation so the first stage in the case of logging operation is cruising in the case of cruising a forester will move through the forest will note down will mark each and uh, will enumerate each and every tree and note down what is the species what is the girth what is the height what is the soundness of each and every tree how, uh, what is the amount of branching that is there in in different trees so for instance if you have two trees the first one is having a straight bole and the second one is having a branchy formation now if both of these trees were silviculturally available we would prefer this tree and not this tree because it is easier to work with this straight bole so all these different kinds of information where is each and every tree located what is the species what are the dimensions what is the soundness what is the branchiness does it have a buttress or not all of these are noted down they are enumerated once that is done the next process is that of marking so in the process of marking we choose between between dif, uh, between these different trees to ascertain what uh, which are the trees that will be felled so once you have noted down these trees you say, uh, you say that we are going to cut down this tree and we are not going to cut down this tree now this process will be known as marking of trees now this is done not only on pen and paper but is also reflected on the ground 
how is it reflected on the ground by the use of marking paint. So, this tree will be given a yellow colored paint um, on its trunk, whereas this tree will either not be given any color or will probably be given a blue color. Now, blue color will say that this tree is not to be filled, the orange or yellow color will say that this tree is to be filled. Now, we also have different other standard colors, red color is for a boundary line, white color is for a, a research plot, a black color is for overwriting. So, the forester will after enumeration he has marked these trees and he has gone to the field and he has painted these trees with different colored strips. Now, once that happens, then typically it is now uh, given up to a contractor or in the case of Madhya Pradesh, we give it to a production division. Now, the people in the production division will now go to the forest and will start cutting these trees. Now, how is a tree cut? The first stage is to ensure that you have sufficient amount of protection in that area. So, the people are given training, they are given uh, typically the protective equipments. You make a plan about uh, the, the leaning of different trees. So, for instance, suppose there is a tree that is leaning like this. So, it is better to make it fall in this direction than in the other direction. If you wanted to make a tree fall to the other side, that is also possible. So, you have this tree that is leaning to this direction, but then typically, uh, but then pr probably you are having an electrical line in this side. So, you do not want this tree to fall to this side, this is to be avoided. So, what you will do is you will attach ropes to this tree and you will start pulling it in the other direction and then you will make your cuts. So, that it does not fall in its leaning direction, but typically we prefer a tree to fall to its leaning direction. Now, certain modifications have to be made to the leaning uh, to the to the direction of felling, so that your tree does not fall on another tree, because if that happens then both these trees will get damaged. Then we also ensure that it does not fall on any other establishment, it does not fall on any other infrastructure such as road or say a power line or say a water line and so on. Now, once you have decided uh, what is the direct uh, what is the direction in which you are going to fill your tree, the next thing is to plan an escape route. Now, escape route is if you have this tree and is it is going to be filled in this direction. So, there are these two escape routes and so the person who is cutting or filling this tree, if anything if any mishap happens, he or she should use these escape routes which are typically at 45 degrees and there is a very low chance that your tree will fall on this line. So, once that has been done and people have been made aware of, next we start to fill the tree. Now, in the case of filling, we, we begin by creating a face. A face is created on a tree by giving it a top cut. So, if the tree has to be filled in this direction, you will give it a top cut like this, then a bottom cut. And when you have created these cuts and you have removed this wood, then it creates a face. So, this is how the face will look like. So, this is now a face in the tree. So, this face was built using a top cut, a bottom cut, both of which together are known as the front cut and this depth is typically d by 3, where d is the diameter at this spot. Then you start giving it a back cut. So, you start cutting it typically it is done at a slightly higher location. So, you will start cutting it from here and you will probably make use of a saw to make the back cut. Typically, we avoid the use of axes, we basically use saws 
because you have to cut down the fibers one by one and these fibers are already in a stretched position. So, consider that you have a very uh, large number of strings that are kept taut and you are slowly and slowly you are cutting the, the strings one by one. So, that this tree will now lose its rigid uh, its rigidity and it will start falling. So, as soon as you start making these cuts this a back face will get created and your tree will start to topple to this side. And typically by the time you have reached roughly half of this portion this tree would have already fallen down and this would have fallen down through the construction of a hinge at this location. So, hinge is the amount of wood that has not been cut. So, it was neither a part of the front cut, it was not the part of the back cut, but because your tree was falling apart. So, this portion uh, the fibers in this portion they get stretched and it forms a hinge which helps you uh, which helps us to make this tree fall in a more gentle manner which will in turn help us to protect uh, this uh, timber from damage. So, these are the cuts that we make to the tree. Now, once your tree has come down to the ground the next operation is that of delimbing. Now, delimbing is the process in which the branches of the tree are gotten removed off are gotten rid of. So, the branches are removed the leaves are typically left on the forest floor and once that is done the next process is that of bucking. Now, in the case of bucking in, in place of canning the whole timber together you cut it into smaller portions and these smaller portions are then skidded to the landing site. Now, in the case of skidding you are not lifting this timber and putting it into a truck instead what you are doing is that you are attaching it with say a vehicle or say an elephant or in certain cases we even make use of helicopters or even make use of cable cars. So, in this case the wood will be attached and then it will be skidded. So, when this is skidded it is you are trying to move it across uh, or between different trees. So, that it comes to the landing site. Now, landing site is that location where your uh, vehicle can come and at the landing site you pick up these logs and put them into a truck. Typically we make use of cranes or forwarders to move uh, to lift these logs and put them onto the truck. From this truck it is it will now go to a depot. Now, in all this process it is very important to keep records. The typical records are the enumeration record which uh, which was done during the cruising phase. Also the marking record which was done during the marking phase. Once your uh, tree has been cut down then it will be hammered and different pieces will get their own numbers which will then be noted down into the filling register and when these logs are being transported they will be again uh, records generated. Now, once these logs have reached into your depot then they will be, uh, be taken down from the truck typically again either using forwarders or by using cranes. Now, once they have reached into the, the depot then again we will make uh, certain records we will go for the seasoning process in which case the amount of moisture in the timber is gradually reduced to avoid the uh, to avoid any warping or any defects that could have crept inside. Then we make uh, and then we grade these logs uh, so that all the logs which are of the same quality the same diameter and the same length are, uh, are put together in the form of a lot and then these lots are typically auctioned off. And after auctioning people can make use of these logs to create furniture or they can go with, uh, with more modern products such as plywood, plyboard, particle board and so on. So, this is the process of logging and processing of timber. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.